The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, the rise and fall of too many civilizations, God choosing the leader by way of Powerball, politics in space, and more E-Arcs than you can shake a stick at. Or two. Just two E-Arcs. Plus, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Editorial Assistant Christopher Rocchio, filling in for Tony Daniel, who was last seen entering a wardrobe in the back of the office. I hope he's okay. We have a bit of a different show for you today, with part one of a two-part roundtable discussion with David Drake, Michael Z. Williamson, and Susan R. Matthews, in which we muse about political systems in science fiction and speculate about the distant future of our own world. And, of course, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of The Sea Without a Shore by David Drake. Now, here's the news. Spring is here, and E-Arcs are in the air, bringing with them all the promise of a new season and new tales of high adventure. But what is an E-Arc? Excellent question, friend. In Celtic mythology, an E-Arc, or Arc, as it is said in the languages of pre-Roman Britain, is a kind of sprite endemic to the woods of southern Cornwall. They're known to emerge this time every year at the start of spring, and to cause all manner of mischief, from turning the milk sour to tripping old ladies down the stairs. Just kidding. An E-Arc is an electronic advanced reader's copy, because we here at Bain know that you, dear reader, cannot wait for some of our books, and with Bain, you don't have to. We make our advanced copies available for you to purchase, only on BaneEbooks.com. We've got two E-Arcs for you up this month. Up first is Red Vengeance by Brendan Du Bois, the sequel to the alien resistance story Dark Victory. U.S. Army Sergeant Randy Knox is 16, and already a seasoned veteran. He is an alien-killing prodigy who has eradicated more of the invading creepers than anyone can keep track of. But Randy is also a high school student struggling with geometry. And he is a young man whose heart is being pulled in two directions by two very different girls. One, Abby Monroe, is a straightforward warrior. The other, Serena Coulson, dangerous and mysterious. Randy, with the help of Serena's strange brother, alien interpreter Buddy Coulson, has convinced a creeper base to surrender. After a decade of conflict, misery, and the death of millions of humans, it finally seems that the war may come to an end. But then the surrender effort turns into a bloody ambush. More disturbing, Buddy and Serena Coulson arrive, having escaped torture and interrogation at the hands of a CIA operative. It begins to dawn on Randy that, as much as he doesn't want to believe it, the powers that be may not want the war to be over. Now, as Randy's hodgepodge military unit makes a desperate stand at a remote outpost, young Sergeant Randy Knox learns just how far he will go to protect those he loves, and what it takes to save humanity from total alien domination. And in addition to that, we have The Day After Gettysburg from the late alternate history master Robert Conroy, finished with the help of J.R. Dunn. Lee strikes back. After a terrible setback at Gettysburg, General Robert E. Lee does not retreat across the Potomac and his ultimate surrender at Appomattox. Instead, he turns the tables on Union General George Meade with a vicious counterattack that sets the Union Army on its heels. While Lee sets across Pennsylvania in a dazzling war of maneuver, a crazed actor closes in on President Abraham Lincoln. Standing in his way is Major Steve Thorne, a thoughtful lawyer-turned-soldier fighting for the Union and his own self-respect, and Cassandra Baird, a young woman whose courage is only surpassed by her determination to teach emancipated slaves to read and write, and so to ensure their freedom. Opposing them is Colonel Corey Wade, a brave Confederate officer who is just as determined to fight to the death for his honor and that of his state. And in the end, the fate of a nation may come down to a freed slave named Hadrian, a man with an iron resolve never to return to bondage. The time has come to strike a blow for liberty, or to go down swinging. 
The Earks for Red Vengeance by Brendan Du Bois and The Day After Gettysburg by Robert Conroy and J.R. Dunn are now available only at BaneEbooks.com. The following is part one of a two-part interview with David Drake, Michael Z. Williamson, and Susan R. Matthews. Part two will be available on the podcast next week. I want to welcome a trio of Bain writers to the podcast today. First up is David Drake, who's joining us here in the office today. Mr. Drake was attending Duke University Law School when he was drafted. He served the next two years in the Army, spending 1970 as an enlisted interrogator in the 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment in Vietnam and Cambodia. Upon return, he completed his law degree at Duke and was, for eight years, assistant town attorney for Chapel Hill, North Carolina. He has been a full-time freelance writer since 1981. His books include the genre-defining and best-selling Hammer Slammers series, the nationally best-selling RCN series, including In the Stormy Red Sky, The Road of Danger, The Sea Without a Shore, and Death's Bright Day. Also joining us is Michael Z. Williamson. Mr. Williamson is retired military, having served 25 years in the U.S. Army and the U.S. Air Force. He was deployed for Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Desert Fox. Williamson is a state-ranked competitive shooter in combat rifle and combat pistol. He has consulted on military matters, weapons, and disaster preparedness for Discovery Channel and Outdoor Channel Productions, and is editor-at-large for Survival Blog, with 300,000 weekly readers. In addition, Williamson tests and reviews firearms and gear for manufacturers. Williamson's books set in his Freehold universe include Freehold, The Weapon, The Rogue, Better to Beg Forgiveness, Do Unto Others, and When Diplomacy Fails. He is also the author of time travel novel A Long Time Until Now, as well as The Hero, the latter written in collaboration with the New York Times bestselling writer John Ringo. And lastly, we're joined by Susan R. Matthews. Susan Matthews was raised in a military family and spent her younger years living around the globe in a myriad of places, including Germany, both coasts of the U.S., and India. Matthews' debut novel, An Exchange of Hostages, the first entry in her critically acclaimed Under Jurisdiction series, was nominated for the Philip K. Dick Award. Matthews was also a finalist for the John W. Campbell Award for Best New Writer. There are now seven novels in the Under Jurisdiction series. The first six are collected in two omnibus editions, Fleet Inquisitor and Fleet Renegade. The newest entry in the series is Blood Enemies, published by Bain Books. Matthews lives in Seattle with her wife, Maggie, and two delightful dogs. She is a veteran of the U.S. Army, where she served as operations and security officer for a combat support hospital. She is also an avid ham radio operator. Welcome all. Hi, Chris. Thanks. So, uh, Tony Daniel and David Afsharad have exhausted this month's supply of newly released books, and we all thought it might be nice to do something a little bit different today. And, of course, we like to live a bit dangerously here at Bain, so I thought, what better way to do that than to talk politics in 2017? <laughs> <laughs> but only imaginary politics, of course, because love them or hate them, political systems, be they utopias or dystopias or just regular old topias, are everywhere in science fiction. Sometimes they take a back seat to the story at hand, but sometimes they're as much a part of the tale as the characters themselves. And I was hoping to ask a few questions about galactic empires and republics and all the rest, so, uh, shall we? <clears throat> okay. Uh, thought we'd start a little closer to home. Uh, how important are the politics of the worlds you create to your world building? Uh, are they absolutely critical, or are there other forces that take precedence for you, and uh, what's your reasoning behind that? Um... In my case, if I'm writing about a war, which is not infrequently the case, the po <laughs> well, I, I, look, I write about other things, but yeah, if there's a war going on, then there's a political reason for it, and it may be a really stupid reason, not infrequently is, uh, but I usually pick a piece of real history as the background, and I try to pick something that most people won't know a hell of a lot about, like, oh, the Greek mainland in uh, 209 B.C., the sort of, you know, stuff that is quite real and is even pretty well documented, but uh, is not on the top of everybody's, uh, oh, yeah, of course, everyone knows right, about that. Right, it's not that. World War Two. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it is important. Uh, but I think think you touch on a distinction that I think should be emphasized. There are people in, in SF and elsewhere who are writing about a political system as 
that is the point of the book to attack or support a particular political philosophy. And there are people, and I fall into this category, where the politics is a necessary background, uh, but I'm not advocating or even horrified by anything. Uh, you know, oh, well, that's how it was, but I will pass now. Well, to an extent, your environment is going to affect the politics. You know, the uh, resources affect the uh, finances available to a society, which affects how they're going to construct their governments and what it's going to be able to do. Um, the geography matters, all kinds of things tie into it. Then there's the cultural and social backgrounds, you know, those times when those are indistinguishable from the politics, and they always color it to some degree. And so there's places and times where certain governments are feasible for your story and somewhere they're not, and somewhere you can make it work if you come up with a, a good justification, which is what writers do. So more of an emergent phenomenon. Story first, and then... Really like the, uh, let me see if I can pick one. Medieval Japan, um, their population pressure and resources directly colored their feudalism and caused it to work considerably longer than it did in Europe. And uh, it was quite stable for a long time. Uh, there was m most of the world, that would not have been feasible. It just wouldn't have happened. All right, so, so you... You start at a more fundamental level than dealing with things like the environment and then building from there. Well, you can reverse engineer. If you, if you want a particular government, you, you find a, a way to construct it for the story. Ah, okay. And you know, go backwards from there to what else, else you have. But they have to fit each other appropriately. What about you, Susan? I think uh, I think I really like the point that David Drake made uh, at the beginning of this part of the discussion about the idea that some books are clearly more or less about a political system in one sense or another, whether it's to uh, whether the point of the novel is to support a system or to uh, criticize it. Um, I think that the issue of world building is really critical depending on what genre you're in and uh, what kind of a story you're writing, as David indicated. Um, I, I have an idea that world building is um, much more foregrounded in a fantasy series, and it could be mistaken because I don't read much fantasy. Please don't tell anybody. Um, <laughs> Not a soul. <laughs> um, <laughs> for myself, the issue of what uh, actually started with the, uh, the fact that I wanted to tell a story about a particular individual and the challenges that he was facing in his life. And to do that, I really had to engineer a situation in which the character would be forced, more or less, to move in the direction that I intended for him to go. So uh, for that kind of a story, where I really wanted to uh, present Andre with uh, my protagonist with a limited number of uh, uh, avenues that he could actually try to uh, follow in order to solve some of his uh, problems, uh, it was clearly necessary to think a lot about what kind of a political background would he come from, would he be living in, in order to make it reasonable to the reader that he had no choice but to do uh, uh, choose Paisley over Shearsucker because it was after uh, the life, <laughs> for instance. Um, something that makes the character's dilemma uh, and challenges uh, uh, comprehensible to the reader as, as far as I could. Um, the uh, the thing that I like, uh, and this uh, speaks a little bit to the points that uh, Mike and David have been making, the thing that I like about uh, operating in a uh, space opera environment, if, if I can call it that, is that uh, if you're dealing with different cultures, you have the opportunity to uh, touch on different systems of government in each, in each place, uh, which I think adds color and texture to the story. But one of the things I really like about building political backgrounds is that uh, you read your history and you look at something you think, uh, nobody's going to believe that this is actually uh, a system of government or a form of government or the result of a certain selection of, uh, of governmental structures. Nobody's going to believe that that ever really happened. And it did, so that you can talk about people. I've talked to people about things at conventions. Uh, may I throw something in here because it's really in point? Um, in 1970, Sprague de Camp wrote a novel called Fallible Fiend, 
it's really the last of his books that's marginally worth reading, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> uh, but in the course of it, the characters enter a community where they have decided that God will pick the best leader. And so all of the uh, citizens are given a number, and the numbers are all dropped through a sorting file, and the number that pops out becomes the leader of the community. Now, this is one of those obviously ridiculous things, and of course they pick an idiot, or the gods pick an idiot, and the, the place is immediately conquered. However, uh, I, I know a, a bit of Greek history, and that was actually the system that Athens went to in the early 5th century. Uh, however, while the system is correct, what happened in reality is that the highest elected office, you know, below, the, the head of state was the archon, and you still have archons, but all they did in after they began to be chosen by lot was to um, give their name to the year. And the highest elected office, which was general, Stratagos, became the effective ruler. So while this is a real system, uh, what actually happened was um, that it, it's... Real human beings don't do something ridiculous simply because they've got a law that says they ought to. And Sprague, I'm sure, well, I'm not sure, uh, but I assume knew that. But um, for the sake of his story, he just said, ah, they're idiots, uh, you know, what fools these mortals be. And they're all wiped out. All right, so there's a, there's a certain point past which people will just put their foot down and not accept the weird? Well, it, it, that seems to have been the case, yeah. Are there any other like weird examples? I know, Susan, you were talking about seeing things weird from history, but uh, and, and Mike, you talked about feudalism in Japan outliving <clears throat> Western feudalism by, what, about, it's about 400 years, isn't it? Well, I, I like to talk to people about the Chinese legalists um, <laughs> and the, <laughs> the, the generally mind-boggling and amusing fact that, you know, one of those things, nobody would ever believe that, that's like, that such things could happen uh, with its uh, corollary that a lot of us believe that we are making some things up for the first time. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, in building a repressive and authoritarian <laughs> government, I really kind of focused on a particular period of of history and the development of Chinese statecraft, and I think that I'm talking about the Warring States period, about 200 uh, mm. B.C. in China, uh, immediately prior to the ascendancy of the first Qin Emperor. Uh, the Chinese legalists' philosophy of government was very similar in some ways to that of any totalitarian state. The uh, particular element that uh, I remember most clearly is the formation of people into small groups, each of, when, each of which was morally and legally obliged to inform on anybody else in the group uh, who expressed any uh, contrary political opinions or who was guilty of any minor crime. Or And failing that, the entire group of, of people would be annihilated. Uh, the degree to which the uh, early Chinese emperor empires of whatever sort uh, annihilated the political op opposition uh, beggars uh, the imagination, uh, not only you and your immediate family, but uh, the immediate family and the uh, brothers and sisters and aunts and cousins of your parents and of their parents, and in some cases out into six uh, generations or six degrees of kinship, kill them all. Uh, it's very difficult to imagine, in, to me, to imagine such a thing actually happen. And yes, this and yet this was a um, this was an historically consistent approach to political dissidence. But if you put that in a novel, it would be difficult to find many people who would look at that and say, oh, yes, Chinese legalists, this sort of thing does happen. Because as far as I know, in our current uh, modern world, 
we're not uh, executing you, your parents, their parents, their parents' parents, and everybody else who is related or descended from any of those people uh, because you have voted for the wrong political candidate uh, or expressed a politically contrary view that's considered to be sufficiently threatening to the state. Uh, so anybody, I think, in, in this group or other groups who has uh, made a study of, of history has, has got access to a whole bunch of really weird stuff. Uh, the requirement to inform on your neighbor, um, I associate in my mind with a modern totalitarian state and find out that it's at least as old, as far as I can tell, as a statecraft uh, uh, to begin with. I, I think that probably be an example, Christopher. What about you, Mike? Can you think of anything bizarre from history? Surprising, at least? It's hard for me to pick one particular one that's weird and the other. So, you know, all these things repeat. That sounds, um, the one described there sounds like, like, like Mao in the it modern does. day. Yeah. Yeah. That's I've what I was thinking. In some regards. Um, there's been so many systems, all of which work to some degree, obviously, because the societies survived for a while. I mean, it take, <laughs> well, I couldn't select. I, I couldn't pick just one. That's that's a fair. I mean, history is a weird collection of strangers. I was thinking about the 20th century, though. A bunch of what Susan said reminded me of, of Mao and, and Stalin. Oh, God. Well, the, the whole collective punishment thing, uh, which caused a lot of problems uh, between European powers and China in the 19th century, uh, because if a ship came into a Chinese port and one of the sailors, you know, uh, committed an, an infraction, the local reaction tended to be to grab a sailor from that ship and uh, punish him. Uh, it had nothing to do with the particular sailor who was involved, and, and there were some really nasty incidents and, and indeed wars as a result of just two different philosophies. So far as the Chinese were concerned, the the ship was a sodality, and anything that a portion of that did was done by the whole body, and punishing any portion of that was as good as getting the man who actually did it. Uh, and, you know, that's that's not necessarily a bad way to approach it, but it's different from the normal Western method. I'll stop there. Yeah. Um, so do you think that since all of these things, you wouldn't think about totalitarianism as being an, an ancient force, but do you think that maybe, to bring it back to science fiction, that if we, if we travel beyond the one planet, that there'll be a, uh, a fundamental change in the nature of these political structures just because the geography changes so tremendously? Maybe that would have some sort of impact on the structure of society. That'll certainly, um, it'll certainly add other factors that have to be taken into consideration. Um, I had a lengthy discussion with a uh, elite Naval Academy graduate at one convention uh, about the fundamental change space travel makes to warfare. Um, one of the, uh, Larry Niven's done it and so some others. If you've got an asteroid uh, and, and uh, extra Earth, they say society versus Earth, whichever one provides a critical resource the other society needs makes the rules, and there is no war. It, it, it's as simple as that, unless the other side can find a way to either acquire that resource or very quickly uh, uh, project their power into the equation. No room for negotiation, really. I might be with the partial interest. Uh, if you can drop rocks on them and they can't stop you, they pretty much have to speak to your wishes. And it works both ways. Um, as far as interstellar travel, from what we currently know, it's going to be hugely expensive, very complicated, not very efficient, and take a long time, which pretty much precludes war. Uh, so any using that as a basis, any system that gets inhabited, that the colony will set its own rules, and Earth really won't be able to do much about it. Let's talk about that. Yeah. 
I, I think that's yeah. a good point, yes. Susan, talk. <laughs> Make it so. <laughs> um, because when, uh, when I looked at the question in the, in the email that you sent, uh, do you think space travel will change the nature of political structures and uh, what kind of political structure uh, might, uh, might survive? Um, I started, I, I immediately thought about Iceland, actually, um, because if you like saga literature, you've got to think about Iceland. Uh, and the situation in Iceland during the uh, saga period being that in which uh, there was really limited external control, if any, because of the difficulties of moving men and materiel and families uh, from wherever they were to Iceland. Um, there being a, uh, a lack of a central government in Iceland meant to an extent, uh, well, to a significant extent, extent, they brought their political structure with them, and it was one that we would recognize possibly as something close to modern parliamentary uh, structure. Um, it, until the age of thus and such, Iceland had no police force, uh, and the fact that the enforcement of cultural uh, disapproval of infractions based on how severe they were and how detrimental they were to the body politic had to be entrusted to uh, what amounted to uh, powerful warlords, men of influence. And we're talking about a really, really small uh, population here. So I'm thinking, well, the first and most obvious impact that interstellar travel could have on the selection and the efficacy of the system of government uh, depends on the on the uh, issue of communication. Uh, how much efficient and effective communication, mm -hmm. both in uh, what we think what we think about is, is talking on the telephone, for instance, uh, is a parent organization or society going to be able to to exert on a population that's left the system, as it were, so to speak? Um, and, and thinking about that leads a person to thinking about the situation in the um, British presence in subcontinental India and the uh, extent to which the parent offices in England could and more frequently could not maintain any control over the policy and the enforcement of policies uh, of its representatives in India until the communication uh, improved to the fact that, uh, to, to the extent that, or to the, yeah, to the extent that um, the parent company in London could actually rein its representatives in, though not with uh, physical force, but with the force of the authority and the uh, command chain, if you will. So I think that uh, the question of what kind of politics and what kind of political structures will be successfully uh, transplanted, if you will, uh, to interstellar tra uh, space travel depends a lot. I, as I think, uh, David, maybe it was uh, indicated earlier, depends a lot on how quickly the source government can get a hold of a colonial offshoot or refugee population or any, or any such uh, excursion and exert uh, meaningful control in communication, but also in uh, physical force. I, I think that's what I got. Yeah, absolutely. My favorite example of that sort of thing was the way Russia in the 19th century, well, 18th and 19th, but mainly 19th century, conquered uh, Asian uh, Russia. And this was done against uh, the diktat of uh, St. Petersburg, but the local generals on the borders knew that they wouldn't get promoted if they just manned border forts, but if they conquered the next tribe on successfully, they would wind up being promoted, even though they did it against orders. And of course, if they lost, then, you know, they were screwed anyway, but, but the, the entirety of Asian Russia was really conquered piece by piece by the local generals. And St. Petersburg screamed, and it did absolutely nothing a thousand, two thousand, three thousand miles away, even when they got 
railroads through, and that was not very early in the process. Uh, there was simply no way the czar could make anything happen if the locals didn't want that particular thing for their own personal reasons. And so the, the whole Chechen problem <laughs> and such uh, was created not by Russian policy, but against Russian policy. I've, I've seen that exact process take place in the um, contemporary military at a couple of uh, training facilities near here where they were specifically told how to spend their budget and on what training and went ahead and tried to annex other facilities against mm -hmm. orders mm -hmm. uh, for the purpose of more budget. Yeah. Uh, All but same, uh, same process. You know, the general doesn't want to make things more efficient and have less troops under his, fewer troops under his command. He wants to have a larger command. <laughs> I, I said this, I, I think it was actually in a forward some years ago, and I've, it remains true. Once you give a 19-year-old an automatic rifle and drop him in a foreign country, you have created a policymaker. And if the shit hits the fan, he will do what he needs to do to uh, save his own ass. And that's just how it is. Uh, and depending on the level of uh, control, he'll do what he feels like doing when he gets bored. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, I'm a nom vet. Yes, that's absolutely true. Oh, well. <laughs> I, I, well, you know, look at Bloody Sunday in Northern Ireland. And this was caused because somebody got the bright idea that they ought to send troops in to do police work. And, you know, it might have worked if they'd sent the Royal Marines, but instead they sent a battalion of the Parachute Regiment. And the, these are both estimable outfits, but... The job of the parachute regiment is to be dropped into a really bad spot and shoot your way out. That's what they're trained to do. And as soon as a shot was fired in Dublin, a lot more shots were fired, and they were all very accurate. And every single one of those civilians shot dead was facing, was a male of military age, facing and probably throwing something in, in many cases at the troops. And it's a terrible thing, and it was a massacre, but the people responsible for it were in Whitehall, not, not the troops on the ground. They were doing what they were trained to do. Think about that. <laughs> yeah. The reason I got onto this question in in the first place is I, I I think when I was about fourteen I read Ian Banks I don't know Dave and I talked about yeah this the a little culture bit. series yeah the culture series um, he's uh, I don't know if either of you have read it um, Susan Mike but it's um, he's sort of a anarchist and he's got this very advanced this ridiculously advanced to the point of comedy uh, utopia in in, uh, in in space and he. Wrote an essay about it once because I, I rather liked the books. I, I disagree with his essential premise, but I liked the books. And he said in this essay that he always imagined that when a large number of people got to space, whatever the actual physics look like, that if we could put a lot of people into orbit and beyond, that states would break down because there wouldn't be any way to manage those people. Uh, and I always thought that was wrong because I figured states wouldn't just let people leave because it's very hard to get off of a planet in the first place. Yeah, but, um, but he sort of covered that one when he said, once you got a large number of people up there. And, and as I, I had the impression that his machine intelligences were of godlike power. If you assume God, and in this case, God may well be a machine, but if you assume God wants people to go out and multiply among the stars, uh, then you've solved that problem. Now, that, that's, but you've got to beg that question. Right. I mean, I was, you know, like I said, I like the books. I just, I don't know mm -hmm. if it's even possible, like assuming godlike machines are possible in the first place. I, I, didn't, I didn't think human nature necessarily would allow for the rest of that to happen. It always seemed... Yeah, I, um, 
I, I think it was Dr. Purnell made the point that people like having a government that does things for them and therefore exercises control over them. And pretty much uh, every government in history has gotten more and more intrusive for good or bad. It goes on. Yeah, it's just the nature well, of... Uh, you know, <laughs> sorry, I, I'm not accustomed to this format, so I... I, I I'm, hey, just, that's why I'm in the office. Uh, it's my first two. <laughs> Um, the, the, a point is, has uh, come up that is associated with the interesting word that, Christopher, you just used, and that is uh, utopia. When a, uh, a writer sets out to consider utopian government, uh, I think that we can all see that there's a really wide range of results that you can get from that philosophical experiment based simply on what your idea of utopian government is. Uh, exactly. people's, yeah, definitely. Yeah, some people's idea of the perfect government is a, a clear line of consistent authority with clearly defined penalties uh, for uh, for deviance of whatever sort. And uh, some people's might might be a divine kingship, and then whatever the monarch does is clearly correct. Uh, theocracy, I think. And considering this, while the course of the discussion has been going on, um, it. it uh, occurred to me that the possibly the single most important determinant in what's going to happen to government and politics when uh, we start to colonize uh, worlds or build colony ships or whatever we're going to do is that what the excuse me what is going to happen and the extent to which a new form of government can be derived and successfully implemented for the uh, for the public wheel is going to depend so, so importantly on whether or not your source population has got a common set of unspoken assumptions. And not to be tedious, but let's go back to Iceland for two seconds. Iceland did man manage to uh, derive a reasonably consistent and reasonably equitable uh, system of government based on the fact that everybody that was coming to Iceland in those old days, they did all have a common cultural background. And so it wasn't that difficult or destructive for a bunch of refugees in a uh, physically remote location with a relative lack of uh, resources, natural resources, to come up with a system of, of uh, peaceably interacting with each other or resolving conflicts that made sense to them. They were all coming from kind of sort of basically the same common understanding of a system that we would recognize as being more or less British or English or Anglo-Saxon. Perulian, actually, I think, European wasn't common it? common law. <laughs> but may I make a point about, since we're on Iceland, what happened in, what, 1735 when Hecla um, erupted and much of the farmland in Iceland was uh, lost under ash. And it was three years before a ship from, I believe, Denmark was ruling the place in theory at the time. And a third of the population died because there was no food. They had no trees, no ships. So they were simply dependent on when somebody came to help them. And it was several years before that happened. And a very high percentage of the population died. Uh, that's also why the uh, Icelandic ponies are so famously gentle. You're only going to keep two horses out of your herd through the next year. You're going to either eat all the others or after Christianity came in, you're going to just drop them in the sea uh, rather than try to feed them through the winter because you can't. You don't have that much fodder. So the ones you keep are the ones that do not bite you. And uh, it, selective breeding works extremely well, probably works with people also. But it's a thing to remember when you talk about the, the great freedom that the Icelandic culture had to develop. Yes, uh, but it came at a price. Talking about artificial selection, too, puts me uh, in mind, actually, of the next question. Uh, which was that maybe just looking at the movement of humankind into space isn't isn't enough. There are plenty of other technological fronts we're pushing, and genetics, uh, <laughs> be it be it artificial selection or the uh, the potentially frightening kind, is definitely one of them. 
But what other technologies do you think could reshape the, the, the face of politics and, and give rise to states we would think of as more science fictional? than? I had thought about the question, and I uh, had come up with a few good and useful things to say about it, except that um, based on my conviction that it, it's the um, timeliness and effectiveness of communication that mm-hmm. made such a big difference uh, when it came to exerting colonial control mm-hmm. in uh, in modern European history, um, I think that the uh, single single most important enabling technologies, once we get past the ones that put us in a situation of having interstellar or intergalactic or whatever uh, a travel to begin with, has got to be the uh, timeliness and effectiveness of communication. So, uh, so my bet, my vote. Uh, for the single most technological uh, requirement or important factor in um, in building robust political structures that actually communicate with each other uh, rather than uh, being um, restricted to the to the local environment as it were uh, you know i 'm going to go for for data management systems uh, that enable effective communications, but I will cheat and weasel to the extent of including the transfer of uh, human resources and material resources and ships and guns and so forth uh, under the uh, under the heading of communication and then mm-hmm. uh, just hope that nobody asks me to explain that very well. Uh, yeah, we need a steamship. Uh, basically, the, the British were not able to control North America uh, by force with sailing ships. If they'd had steamships, you know, uh, they just might have made a better play of it. But yeah, I, I absolutely agree with everything Susan is saying. So faster than light transport communication. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the, the equivalent of, you know, getting there in a reasonable... And, and it's not just that a steamship is faster than a sailing ship. A steamship will get you there on a schedule. And a sailing ship, you not only are not moving as fast, you may spend months not moving at all. So, you know, we we need practical transportation uh, over long distances before you can have large numbers of people in space, I think. I uh, remember having a lengthy discussion with my kids while driving 12 hours to a convention on how uh, modern <laughs> logistics works. So Are we there? Made, that individual purchase is reported all the way back to the source for manufacturing of new goods, that um, space is allotted aboard a container, aboard a ship, aboard the rail, to get that, that placement component to the store. The three things I'd pick would be yeah, weapons, food, and, uh, and data. Uh, if your population can easily be well-fed, then there's less ability to control them, but also less need to. They're comfortable, they're happy, there's less need for them to be rebellious. Um, As far as data, the more you can find out about anyone, the harder it makes it, you know, for for things like blackmail or that. There was a, John Ringo and I had a recent discussion a couple years ago, the requirements they used to have for uh, background checks for security clearances. These days, uh, anyone who's ever uploaded a photo of themselves doing something silly on the internet would probably not qualify using those rules. Those rules have had to change and will have to continue to change because you can't hold people to these mythical standards that they never actually met anyway. They could just pretend they did, in large part. And it will become less and less negative. That affects both your ability to control them and their ability to uh, to hide things. And then as far as weapons, uh, a hobby of mine, the, the comment I made the other day was that until your gun collection has its own lawyer, its own bank accounts, and correspondence with the ATF, you don't really have a gun collection. <laughs> and my gun collection does have a um, Legal in the U.S. to manufacture your own firearms. There's rules regarding what you can manufacture. And it used to be that they assumed that you were there with a manual mill and hand tools and cutting and grinding and drilling. And these days, anyone can afford a digital desktop mill. You know, for, for a couple thousand dollars, you can have a 3D digital mill on your tabletop, load in the code from the Internet, 
and start producing parts. The, not, the information on heat treating is readily available online. You can do some of it on the stove top. You can do some of it with a easily fabricated oven. At this point, straying into contemporary politics, gun control is effectively a dead issue. There is no way you can stop someone from having a gun. It, it, it's just infeasible, and any of those laws have become totally irrelevant. At the other end, we see the same thing with nuclear weapons. The only reason there aren't more nukes out there is because all the governments try to maintain very strict control over the specific nuclear material. Mm-hmm. The knowledge of how to make one is very easy to find public domain. I mean, even, even North Korea was able to make a nuke. <laughs> yeah. Pakistan is an effective nuclear power. And if you've seen some of the other products they produce, that's kind of frightening. Um, <laughs> yes. So, yeah. All of, all of this is going to continue. There will be it'll be harder and harder to stop people from getting anything they want. And, but at the same time, if they're well fed and comfortable, there's not a whole lot of reason for most of them to be a problem. And all that's going to affect what a government needs to focus on: domestic versus external threats versus uh, competing political threats, and you'll wire your political system competing if you both have everything you need. Leave the other leave the other side to do what they want and move on with your own. That was part one of our two-part interview with David Drake, Michael Z. Williamson, and Susan R. Matthews. For part two, please tune in next week right here on the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. Now we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. It seems Cinnabar's chief spymaster is a mother also, and her son is determined to search for treasure in the midst of a civil war. Who better to hold the boy's hand and to take the blows directed at him than Captain Daniel Leary, the Republic of Cinnabar Navy's troubleshooter, and his friend the cyberspy Adele Mundy, the only thing certain in the struggle for control of the mining planet Corsera is that the rival parties are more dangerous to their own allies than to their opponents. Daniel and Adele face kidnappers, pirates, and a death squad even before they can get to the real business of ending the war on Corsera and bringing their charge home, maybe along with ancient alien treasure. Now here is the next entry of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. Chapter 29 Cleveland's World A quarter mile from the slope where Daniel stood, steam wreathed the Madison merchant an instant before the sound arrived. It was a snarling roar instead of the usual pillowy thump of a ship lighting her thrusters. The freighter's bow lifted, then slapped back onto the water as the man at the controls closed his throttles in panic. They didn't flare their nozzles, Cazalet said. They're lucky that they didn't break her back when they came down like that. Didn't or couldn't, Daniel said with satisfaction. They left the thrusters sphinctered after they landed. When the algae coated the pedals, they wouldn't open properly. Daniel had landed on a knoll which was at 90 degrees to his quarry's long axis. For the Madison merchant's gun to bear, she had to rotate at least 45 degrees. 60 would be better. After Sorley's abortive attempt to lift his ship in turn, the merchant floated in exactly the same relation to the Kaisha as she'd had to begin with. Why won't they be able to lift now, though? Cazalet said. They'll have burned off the algae. Or do you think they won't dare try because they don't know what the problem is? Daniel grinned, though his eyes were following his negotiating team. The thoughts behind his expression weren't quite as cheerful as he tried to project. Adele had paused for a moment when the thrusters lit, but she and her companions resumed their trudge downward when the merchant settled back. Adele held a white flag in her right hand, but nobody imagined that Sorley or his crew would take any notice of it. The algae fixes calcium, Daniel said. Not huge amounts, of course, but too much for the tolerances between the petals of a thruster nozzle. Calcium vaporizes at well over 2,200 degrees. Yes, it will burn off, but not cleanly enough to allow the petals to slide properly, not from a short pulse like that. The merchant's attempt to rise had shaken the outcrop on which the Kaisha rested. Steam puffed out of a recent crack in the rock, sending a scatter of pebbles down the slope toward where Daniel and Cazalet stood. 
This side was too gentle to manage a real avalanche. The rattle of stone on stone petered out before anything reached the men. I hadn't thought about our thrusters cracking the rock, Daniel said. It would have been embarrassing if we'd gone sliding down into the lake beside the merchant, wouldn't it? Not the sort of impression I was trying to give Captain Sorley. I don't think it happens very often, sir, said Cazalet. I don't know of another captain who would have willingly landed on a point of rock. The Madison merchant floated in what was either a lake, a lagoon, or a meandering river, depending on how it was fed. A campsite with sailcloth shelters and a remarkable amount of trash for no more than two days of occupancy stood on the beach at the end of the catwalk from the main hatch. The men whom Daniel had seen on shore while the Kaisha was in orbit had vanished back into the ship, and the freighter's hatch was closed. I didn't really need to land so high up, I think, Daniel said. The algae doesn't seem to advance more than 20 feet from the lake shore, even in the wet season. It must be drawn to metal, or maybe electrical charges. He gestured. Cleveland's world was placid atmospherically and geologically. The lake's barren margin resulted from regular flooding. The Madison merchant lighted its thrusters again, but only three of them and all toward the stern. They were properly flared, so though the ship rocked as the water around it boiled, there was no risk of it trying to lift off again. She's got eight thrusters, Cazalet said, but only six were functioning when she lifted from Brotherhood Harbor. I checked imagery from the harbor master's office, and three won't lift her, even if they weren't asymmetric. Well observed, Daniel said. The praise was real, though the warmth he put into his voice was a little exaggerated. They seem to have checked their instruments this time, and only lighted the units which opened properly instead of just assuming they were working. Cazalet was an excellent officer, a man Daniel would be pleased to have serving under him, even if Cazalet were not Adele's protege. He came from a commercial rather than naval background, which was useful for many reasons. For example, Cazalet was more likely than Corey or Daniel, to check the harbor master's records to see how well a freighter's plasma thrusters were functioning. RCN officers, or their fleet equivalents, came to assume that a starship's basic systems were operating properly unless there had been an emergency. Cazalet was personable, cultured, and intelligent. He was a stabilizing influence in Lieutenant Vesey's life, with none of the exuberant manliness of midshipman Dorst, her previous lover. Dorst had never been consciously cruel, but he was a young man to whom a few too many drinks or an attractive stranger were not so much a temptation as a way of life. Daniel smiled, much as I was myself, and still am to a degree. Dorst had been thick as two short planks. His sister Miranda appeared to have gotten a double set of the brains of their generation. Cazalet, by contrast, was extremely clever, though he didn't rub other people's noses in it. Despite all the reasons to feel otherwise, however, Daniel had liked Midshipman Dorst more than he expected ever to like Cazalet, though he knew that wasn't fair. The note of the merchant's thrusters sharpened, then shot off again. Water slopped back and forth against the outriggers, subsiding slowly. Sorley, or whoever was in charge of the present operations, had apparently tried to swing the ship with the three functioning thrusters. It would be possible to do that, but it wouldn't be possible for that clumsy hand on the throttles to do it, at least not without a serious risk of flipping the ship on her side. Adele and her two companions hadn't stopped at this bloom of plasma, though they weren't moving very quickly across the rough landscape. The most common species of local plant sprang in knee-high starbursts from a common base. Daniel had examined a clump that grew from a niche in the outcrop near where he stood. The leaves oozed sticky sap if the ends were brushed. The sap wasn't dangerous. There were no browsing animals here for the vegetation to protect itself against. But like deep mud, it was unpleasant and a thing to avoid. Besides, the negotiators weren't in a hurry. Letting Sorley stew for a while longer might be useful. Most of Daniel's crew were still aboard the Kaisha, in part to keep them out of the way if something started to happen. Hogg was moving down the slope well to Daniel's left. The stocked impeller he held at the balance didn't look particularly threatening unless you knew Hogg. Hale was working toward the Madison merchant on Daniel's right with a slung carbine. Wochens accompanied her. 
The bosun's baton of high-pressure tube was thrust through her belt, but she didn't carry a projectile weapon. Wojcin couldn't hit a target with an impeller from much farther away than she could with a tubing, so that was good judgment on her part. Besides, Wojcin had taken three slugs in the chest a few years ago. Though she had survived, she was even less inclined to pick up an impeller than she had been before. The Madison merchant remained buttoned up. Sorley's watching them, though, Cazalet said in a harsh tone. Their optics are pretty decent, better than any of that can's other equipment anyway. He was watching the negotiators, he watched Vessie at least, with an angry expression. Turning to Daniel, he said, I ought to be down there with them. Daniel didn't smile, though that was his first impulse. Well, his first impulse was to sneer, which wasn't like him and wasn't fair. I wonder if I'm jealous because he's close to Adele. Daniel blinked in horror at the thought. Adele had taken in the orphaned grandson of the woman who had supported Adele when she lost her family and the Three Circles conspiracy. Resenting the boy was, well, it ought to have been unthinkable. Aloud, he said, this business will work best if Sorley and his crew don't feel threatened. I suspect that men of their ilk don't even notice people like Tovera. To the extent there were other people like Tovera. And to the extent that Tovera was a person. I suppose. Cazalet muttered. He squeezed the grip of the submachine gun slung across his chest. The gun was for show, and only because he'd asked for it. Cazalet had proved himself brave and capable in the tussle with the squad, waiting to kill Colonel Bourbon in Brotherhood. But he had used his carbine as a pole rather than a gun. That was more than satisfactory. But Daniel suspected that in the crisis, Cazalet hadn't been able to pull the trigger. He wouldn't be able to pull the trigger this time either. But there wouldn't be any cause to. Hogg wouldn't have to shoot either. Nor Hale, who was working closer than Hogg to get within comfortable range for her less powerful carbine. The impeller slung over Daniel's shoulder wouldn't be used either, but... Sir, said Cazalet. Daniel realized he had been grinning after a fashion. If I had to, he said, I'd aim at the traversing gear of their plasma cannon. The plating there is just for streamlining, and the hydraulic hoses inside won't deflect an osmium slug. They can't bring the gun to bear anyway, can they, sir? Cazalet said. We've seen that when they tried their thrusters. I wouldn't be doing much good, no, Daniel agreed. But it would be something to do. He shrugged fiercely, trying to shake his mind out of the direction it had been drifting. There won't be any trouble. If there were, Adele and Tovera would settle it without any need for the rest of us. That was all true. Daniel spoke forcefully to make the word sound more convincing to Cazalet, and perhaps to the speaker himself. He kept remembering that Midshipman Dorst had been a crack shot. Not that it would be any more useful to have two impellers rather than one turning the merchant's gun housing into a colander, but there would have been a degree of companionship that he didn't seem to have with Cazalet. Which is my fault. Daniel chuckled as the situation reformed in his head. He unslung his impeller and laid it on the slanting rock behind him. Straightening, he said, I've been thinking about this whole business in the wrong way. Let's watch and be entertained by how Adele and Lieutenant Vessie deal with Sorley and his boneheaded crew. Daniel heard the squeal of metal rubbing metal before he saw that the freighter's hatch had begun to open. Worst case, Daniel and Cazalet could watch how Tovera dealt with the kidnappers, but there wasn't any mystery about that. Adele waved the flag from left to right in front of her, then back again. It was a linen napkin attached by grommets to a length of half-inch plastic pipe. Reed and Walkins, both riggers, had made it for her with as much care as if they had been scrimshawing gifts for people back on Cinnabar. Possibly they were even more careful than that, they were doing this for the mistress, for Lady Monday. The flag flicked back and forth. Adele felt extremely foolish, but the uniformed Vessie was in titular charge of their detachment, and Tovera was staying properly in the background. It was Adele's job to display the truce flag, so she would do so properly. Besides, Reed and Walkins had been so proud of their handiwork that it would have been churlish not to brandish it proudly. She was Monday of Chatsworth. No bless oblige. 
When they closed the boarding hatch, the Madisons had left their floating extension attached to the shore and to the starboard outrigger. It was a jury-rigged construction, made by bolting boards onto empty lubricant drums. It was over six feet wide, however, which Adele found comforting in comparison with the more technically impressing boarding bridges she was used to from RCN service. The tight rolls of beryllium alloy with inflatable flotation chambers which Wochins and her crew extended from the sissy's ramp, Mon had equipped the Kaisha with a similar unit, were compact and impressive. They were only 30 inches wide, however, and Adele found that a little tight when bobbing on the surface of the water. She was in the lead. When she was thirty feet or so from the shore, the freighter's main hatch shrieked, beginning to open. Hold up, please, Vessie said in a low voice. Adele paused. She had been skirting a plant that looked as though it had been made by gluing brown drinking straws together. I wonder if I can find information for Daniel on these plants. But of course she couldn't, not here. She had searched every database on board for information about what was now Cleveland's world, and the scant references had been only to the algae. Stop where you are, called a distorted voice from inside the Madison merchant. That was another entry in our complete audiobook serialization of The Sea Without a Shore by David Drake. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And an armada filled with the spoils of vanished empires, laden with treasure and the hopes and dreams of a better world, and with all the voices under the sky uplifted in thanks and praise to David Drake, to Michael Z. Williamson, and to Susan R. Matthews. Please join us here next time at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy, and keep reaching for the stars. <laughs>